Who were the SS? Who were their leaders? How were they organised? And how did they become one of the most evil paramilitary forces history has ever seen? Let's find out on today's episode of the History Chronicles. The Schutzstaffel, or SS, was formed in March 1925 by Adolf Hitler, the leader of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, better known today as the Nazi Party. Its name translates as Protective Echelon, and was set up to guard Hitler and other high-ranking members of the Nazi Party who were coming under increasing threat of political violence, both from members of far-left political organisations and rivals on the far right wing. There were at least eight founding members, all of whom Hitler trusted with his life. Initially under Hitler's direct command, the first leader of the SS was Julius Schreck, a veteran of the First World War and a close ally of Adolf Hitler. Schreck had been a founding member of the SA, the Sturmabteilung, or Storm Detachment, a thuggish band which had played a significant role in Hitler's rise to power in the 1920s and 1930s. Its primary role had been to provide protection for Nazi rallies, harass the opposition, and intimidate Jews, trade unionists, and Romani people. Schreck would serve as SS leader for just one year, although he later served as a chauffeur to Hitler before developing meningitis in 1936. On his death, Hitler accorded him a state funeral. Schreck was succeeded by Joseph Bertholdt, another war veteran who shared the Nazi party's anger at the way Germany had been handled after the Great War and especially the restrictions placed upon it by the Treaty of Versailles. Berthold was also an early member of the SA and was present at the failed coup staged by Hitler, which became known as the Munich Beer Hall Putsch. Under Schreck, the SS had consisted of just a handful of carefully selected members. Berthold was keen to put his own stamp on the SS, changing his title to Reichsführer of the Schutzstaffel and imposing a set of rules which emphasised loyalty to the Nazi party and devotion to Adolf Hitler. He had great ambitions for the SS, but was frustrated by the authority the SA nominally had over his organisation, and just a year after taking over the leadership, Berthold handed the role over to his deputy, Erhard Haydn. After this, he wrote for several Nazi publications before serving as a councillor in Munich, although he remained well-connected in Nazi circles. The third leader of the SS in as many years, Erhard Haydn failed to make much of an impression on the fledgling organisation. And indeed, under his leadership, membership of the SS fell dramatically, well below that of the 1,000 men he inherited. He was dismissed in 1929 officially for family reasons, but was arrested when the Nazis came to power in 1933 and was executed that same year. The type of recruits the SS had initially been looking for were far from exceptional or people who stood out from the crowd. Rather, they were average citizens who usually held low-paid and unskilled jobs. They may have had some previous military experience, but usually they were below or at the rank of an NCO, although they most certainly had joined the Freikorps, the unofficial mercenary army that sprang up following the Great War. At first, they were not political zealots, as most of their founding members did not join the Nazi party right away. There is a high chance early members were brought into both organisations, the SS and the Nazi party, by the Freikorps leaders, as there tended to be crossover between them along with other units of the Nazis, such as the Sturmabteilung, or SA. But one thing was common, in that nearly every person who joined the early Nazi movement resented the government for the handling of the aftermath of the Great War. Haydn was sacked as leader of the SS on the 20th of January 1929 to make way for Hitler's rising star, Heinrich Himmler. Himmler was both enthusiastic and had the organisational talent to take the SS to new heights, initially operating out of 50 Schellingstrasse in Munich, with Himmler being the only member to receive a salary, although to begin with it was only 200 Reichsmarks per month. He sought to expand the SS, and over the next 16 years would turn the battalion of some 300 men into a paramilitary force of more than a million. In the aftermath of the Wall Street crash, political unrest ensued especially with the SA, causing a rift between them and the senior leadership of the Nazi party. At this time, the SA in the berlin gau region was being led by a former police captain and leader of the Freikorps, Walter Stenne. Many SA members were discontented with Hitler's policy to seek change through legal means. They wanted revolution, but Hitler preferred to use them solely for Nazi party purposes. There were also grumblings of poor pay, overwork, favouritism, and the SA's reliance on the party for funding. 
In August 1930, Stenez took his demands for more power within the Nazi party to Joseph Goebbels. Hitler refused to take them seriously, and Stenez came to Munich looking for trouble, wrecking an official building in the process. Hitler returned early from Wagner Festival at Bayreuth to address a meeting of SA stormtroopers which quelled unrest temporarily. But Stenez continued to cause trouble, objecting especially to the lack of resources and the recall of Ernst Röhm to the leadership of the SA, objecting due to his rumoured homosexuality. SA stormtroopers led by Stenez raided the Nazi party headquarters in Berlin on March 31, 1931, taking control of the building and doing the same to the offices of Goebbels' newspaper, Der Angriff. Hitler told Goebbels to use any means possible to quell the revolt. Stenez was expelled from the party. The revolt brought about a rethink in the nature of the SA and the subservient role of the SS within it. As a result, the SS was given control over many of the jobs the SA once had, with the Sturmabteilung essentially being sidelined. Himmler wished to separate the SS's identity from the SA, and in 1932 appointed Richard Dari as the head of the organization's Race and Resettlement Office, which was charged with controlling the racial integrity of its members. One of the most important measures taken by the SS was the marriage law, which oversaw weddings to ensure SS members married healthy Aryans, which the Nazis defined as a superior race. Dare recruited Dr. Schultz and Dr. Reckenbach, who began the concept of scientific eugenic racial examinations, supposedly using measurements from body parts, eye colour and other aspects of the body to determine a person's race. National Socialism continued its rise in the early 1930s with a commitment to crush their perceived enemies. The Jews, Marxists, Democrats, Liberals, Capitalists, the Bourgeoisie, Freemasons, Internationalists and Homosexuals. Himmler made a critical promotion for the SS in the summer of 1931, with Reinhard Heydrich being appointed as the Chief of Intelligence. Heydrich would play a major role in the intelligence community within Nazi Germany and would be a close confidant for Himmler. With Hitler's ascension to the Chancellorship on the 30th of January 1933, the SS stepped even further into the spotlight and into power. Yet, to solidify this power, the SS would need to dispatch their old rivals, the SA, from their position. The SA had become a massive force in Germany, but their influence had been waning, as their usefulness as street thugs were no longer needed. To get rid of the command structure of the SA and weaken them, the SS and newly formed Gestapo, Geheimer Stadt Policia, or Secret Police, fabricated evidence suggesting Ernst Röhm was paid by the French to rebel against Hitler. On the morning of the 30th of June 1934, Hitler, along with SS officers and regular police officers, arrested Röhm and the senior staff of the SA in the town of Bad Wiese. The Night of the Long Knives, as it would be called, would see many political opponents purged, and cemented the SS's dominance over the SA. The SS took control of three concentration camps following the purge, in addition to the SS's own concentration camp, Dachau, which opened on the 22nd of March 1933. Theodor Eicher would be the most influential member of the SS in creating the concentration camps. Most of them, however, apart from Dachau and Lichtenfeld, were closed in early 1936 in order for newly designed camps to open, such as Sachsenhausen in 1936 and Buchenwald opening in the summer of 1937. Another major camp, Flossenburg in Bavaria, opened in May of 1938, along with the first camp in Austria following the Anschluss at Mauthausen. The last of the major pre-war concentration camps was Ravensbrück, opening in May of 1939 as a replacement for Lichtenberg as the women's camp. The SS saw a period of rapid expansion during the mid-1930s, with its membership reaching 50,000 in 1933. Reinhard Heydrich consolidated the organization's strength by gaining control of all of the police forces in Germany and broadening their activities. Special units were formed to receive military training with the army. And by 1939, the size of the SS was now put at 250,000 men, and there was a need, with the outbreak of the war, for further reorganisation. It was divided into two main groups. The Waffen-SS, which itself was divided into three sections, namely the Leibstandarte, which supplied Hitler's bodyguards, the SS Totenkopfverbande, or Death's Head units, which were solely responsible for administering the concentration camps and the later extermination camps. Its name derived from the skull motif which appeared on their camps and the Verfügungstruppe, which were elite combat soldiers serving alongside the regular army. The second division was the Allgemeine SS, which was split into six branches. The Kommandster, who oversaw the military units, Personnel Office, Recruiting Office, Administrative Office for Military Courts, 
administration and supply office, and medical office. In addition to the six main branches, the SS also housed a press department, welfare office, and inspectorate of concentration camps. The SS also had economic interests, leading to the creation of the Wirtschafts- und Verwaltungshauptamt, or Business Administration Main Office. The WVHA became involved in forestry, brickmaking, quarrying, pottery, building materials, bottling, meat processing, bakeries, clothing, and medicine. In order to pursue these interests, the SS would use the exploitation of slave labour through the concentration camps to enrich themselves. During the war, the SS in all its forms was front and centre of the brutality of the Nazi regime. Apart from overseeing the concentration camps, some troops specialised in carrying out atrocities in the countries occupied by the Nazis. Not all were German nationals. Eventually, the Waffen SS included members from Hungary, Yugoslavia, Romania, and even saw volunteers from France and Great Britain. It had become a vast machine for killing and intimidation. By 1944, SS membership was estimated to be closing in on one million people. As German defeat became an inevitability due to troop shortages, Himmler created a new branch of the SS, a ragtag army of teenagers and pensioners named the Volkssturm, who were to be regarded as the country's last line of defence. From the invasion of Poland on the 1st of September 1939 to the Battle for Berlin in 1945, the SS would help carry out the Nazis' reign of terror across Europe. Whether directly engaging in combat against the Allied forces, or deporting and executing undesirables and resistance fighters, the SS would be just as guilty in the human rights abuses as the Wehrmacht. But by the time of the Nuremberg trial, most agreed to put the blame solely on the SS, and downplay the evidence against other organisations, as post-war powers jockeyed for influence within Germany. This agreement, made by the Allies, cemented the SS's legacy as being synonymous with evil, terror, and the Holocaust. Its last leader, Heinrich Himmler, was captured by Allied soldiers, but committed suicide on May 23rd, 1945, by taking a cyanide pill. What are your thoughts on the SS? Is there any doubt that they were one of the most evil organisations in history? You've been watching the History Chronicles. Please like and subscribe to help our channel grow. We appreciate it immensely. If you'd like to support our work going forward, then please visit our Patreon page and we look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the History Chronicles.